A Cargo of Cat by Ambrose Bierce On the 16th day of June, 1874, the ship Mary Jane sailed from Malta, heavy laden with cat. This cargo gave us a good deal of trouble. It was not in bales, but had been dumped into the hold loose. Captain Doble, who had once commanded a ship that carried coals, said he had found that plan the best. When the hold was full of cat, the hatch was battened down, and we felt good. Unfortunately, the mate, thinking the cats would be thirsty, introduced a hose into one of the hatches and pumped in a considerable quantity of water, and the cats in the lower levels were all drowned. You have seen a dead cat in a pond. You remember its circumference at the waist. Water multiplies the magnitude of the dead cat by ten. On the first day out, it was observed that the ship was much strained. She was three feet wider than usual, and as much as ten feet shorter. The convexity of her deck was visually augmented for an aft, but she turned up at both ends. Her rudder was clean out of the water, and she would answer to the helm only when running directly against a strong breeze. The rudder, when perverted to one side, would rub against the wind and slew her around, and then she wouldn't steer any more. Owing to the curvature of the keel, the masts came together at the top, and a sailor who had gone up the foremast got bewildered, came down the mizzenmast, looked out over the stern at the receding shores of Malta, and shouted, Land ho! The ship's fastenings were all giving way. The water on each side was lashing into foam by the tempest of flying bolts that she shed at every pulsation of the cargo. She was quietly wrecking herself, without assistance, from wind or wave, by the sheer internal energy of feline expansion. I went to the skipper about it. He was in his favorite position, sitting on the deck supporting his back against the binnacle, making a V of his legs, and smoking. Captain Doble, I said, respectfully touching my hat, which was really not worthy of respect. This floating palace is afflicted with curvature of the spine, and likewise greatly swollen. Without raising his eyes, he courteously acknowledged my presence by knocking the ashes from his pipe. Permit me, Captain, I said, with simple dignity, to repeat that this ship is much swollen. If that is true, said the gallant mariner, reaching for his tobacco pouch, I think it would be as well to swab her down with liniment. There is a bottle of it in my cabin. Better suggest it to the mate. But, Captain, there's no time for empirical treatment. Some of the planks at the water line have started. The skipper rose and looked out over the stern toward the land. He fixed his eyes on the foaming wake. He gazed into the water to starboard and to port. Then he said, My friend, the whole darn thing is started. Sadly and silently I turned from the obdurate man and walked forward. Suddenly there was a burst of thunder sound. The hatch that had held down the cargo was flung whirling into space and sailed in the air like a blown leaf. Pushing upward through the hatch was a smooth, square column of cat. Grandly and impressively it grew. Slowly, serenely, majestically it rose toward the welkin, the relaxing keel parting at the headmast to give it a fair chance. I have stood at Naples and seen Vesuvius painting the town red. From Catania have marked afar upon the flanks of Etna, the lava's awful pursuit of the astonished rooster and the despairing pig, the fiery flow from Kilauea's crater thrusting itself into the forest and licking the entire country clean, is as familiar to me as my mother tongue. I have seen glaciers a thousand years old and quite bald, 
heading for a valley full of tourists, at the rate of an inch a month. I have seen a saturated solution of mining camps go down a mountain river to make a sociable call on the valley farmers. I have stood behind a tree on a battlefield and seen a compact square mile of armed men moving with irresistible momentum to the rear. Whenever anything grand in magnitude or motion is built to appear, I commonly manage to beat my way into the show, and in reporting it, I am a man of unscrupulous veracity. But I have seldom observed anything like the solid gray column of Maltese cat. It is unnecessary to explain, I suppose, that each individual Grimalkin in the outfit, with that readiness of resource which distinguishes the species, had grappled with tooth and nail as many others as it could hook onto. This preserved the formation. It made the column so stiff that when the ship rolled, and the Mary Jane was a devil to roll, it swayed from side to side like a mast, and the mate said if it grew much taller he would have to order it cut away, or it would capsize us. Some of the sailors went to work at the pumps, but these discharged nothing but fur. Captain Doble raised his eyes from his toes and shouted, Let go the anchor! but being assured that nobody was touching it, apologized and resumed his reverie. The chaplain said if there were no objections, he would like to offer up a prayer, and a gambler from Chicago produced a pack of cards, proposing to throw round for the first jack. The parson's plan was adopted, and as he uttered the final amen, the cats struck up a hymn. All the living ones were now above deck, and every mother's son of them sang. Each had a pretty fair voice, but no ear. Nearly all their notes in the upper register were more or less cracked and disobedient. The remarkable thing about the voices was their range. In that crowd were cats of seventeen octaves, and the average could not have been less than twelve. Number of cats per invoice, 127,000. Estimated number of dead swellers, 6,000. Total songsters, 121,000. Average number of octaves per cat, 12. Total octaves, 1,452,000. It was a great concert. It lasted three days and nights, or, counting each night as seven days, 24 days altogether. And we could not go below for provisions. At the end of that time, the cook came forward, shaking up some beans in a hat, and holding a large knife. Sheepmates, he said, we have done all that mortals can do. Let us now draw lots. We were blindfolded in turn, and drew. But just as the cook was forcing the fatal black bean upon the fattest man, the concert closed with a suddenness that waked the man on the lookout. A moment later, every Grimalkin relaxed his hold on his neighbors, the column lost its cohesion, and, with 121,000 dull, sickening thuds that beat as one, the whole business fell to the deck. Then, with a wild farewell wail, that feline host sprang spitting into the sea and struck out southward for the African shore. The southern expansion of Italy, as every schoolboy knows, resembles in shape an enormous boot. We had drifted within sight of it. The cats in the fabric had spied it, and their alert imaginations were instantly affected with the lively sense of the size, weight, and probable momentum of its flung bootjack. The End of A Cargo of Cat by Ambrose Beard